Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for showing up today morning. Today, I'll be talking about uh, the update on management of Wilms tumor. So, uh, no disclosures to make with respect to this presentation or otherwise. So, the learning objectives for today will be uh, to review the genetics, biomarkers, histopathology, and risk stratification of Wilms tumor. Then I'll discuss the current management as per the two standard protocols, highlighting the major differences and similarities between the COG and the SIO protocol. Next, we'll come to the controversies surrounding the surgical management with emphasis on nephron sparing surgery. And shall end my talk with the long-term implications of the oncological treatment received in childhood for the Wilm tumor survivors. I'll start my presentation with the incidence of renal tumors in pediatric population in Canada. As per the most recent incident statistics of Canadian Cancer Society 2022, in children aged between 0 to 14 years, 170 children were diagnosed with renal and renal pelvic cancers from 2012 to 2016. Almost 40 to 50 new cases every year during this duration. And uh, unfortunately, 11 children they died because of this during the same period. Named after a German surgeon and pathologist, Max Wilms, Wilms tumor, also known as nephroblastoma, is the most common pediatric renal tumor. With an incidence of 1 in 10,000, it accounts for about 85% of the pediatric renal tumors. And it typically occurs before 7 years of age, with the mean age at diagnosis being 3.7 years in unilateral cases and early by an year or so in bilateral cases. The early onset of the bilateral tumors and the occurrence of familial cases, that has long supported the notion that predispositions and hereditary predispositions, they play a role in Wilms tumor development. And rightly so, as 5% of the patients, they have hereditary predispositions and they're broadly divided into syndromes associated with disruptions in WT1 gene, overgrowth syndromes, tumor predisposition syndromes, non-syndromic malformations like hemihypertrophy and genitourinary malformation and familial Wilms. Now, the patients with these syndromes, they have an increased risk uh, of developing the Wilms tumor. And depending upon the amount of risk that they have, they are divided into different risk classifications. Those uh, with the high risk have more than 20% chance of, um, of having Wilms tumor later in their life. And uh, the syndromes, high risk syndromes, they include the Wagner syndrome, which is an acronym for Wilms tumor, anaridia, genitourinary malformations, and mental retardation. And uh, in Wagner, there is th 30 to 50 percent risk. Similarly, we have the Denis Dash syndrome with more than 90 percent risk. And it's a combination of male pseudo hermaphroditism, glomerulonephritis and Wilms tumor. Other than that, there are Perlman syndrome, familial Wilms tumor and Fanconi's anemia, which come under the category of high risk. The overgrowth syndromes like Beck with Weidman syndrome and Simpson's Golabi Bellman syndrome, they have the moderate risk. Recently, several reports have described three novel genes, CTR9, REST, and TRIM28, in which pathogenic germline variants confer an increased risk of Wilms tumor, although the exact mechanism by which these genes contribute to Wilms tumorogenesis is yet to be determined. Now, to assist in determining whether a child with Wilms tumor should undergo a genetics referral, investigators in Canada, they have developed an electronic health decision support tool, the McGill Interactive Pediatric Oncogenetic Guidelines. Uh, and according to these, a patient with Wilms criteria who's diagnosed who, uh, with Wilms tumor who's diagnosed before two years of age has bilateral or multifocal tumors, has stromal predominant histology, presence of nephrologic, nephrogenic rests or overgrowth features. All these patients, they should be taken into account along with the family history and presence of congenital anomalies and or dysmorphic features. And all these children who test positive, they should uh, undergo surveillance with three monthly ultrasounds throughout the period of increased Wilms tumor risk, which is typically up to eight years of age. And the goal of the surveillance in these patients is to detect Wilms tumor while they are low stage and more likely to, more likely to be cured using fewer intensive therapies. Recent advances in understanding the molecular biology of the tumorogenesis, they have provided significant implications for the clinical management. These biomarkers have allowed a better risk stratification and better treatment options in these patients. And more than 30 epigenetic and genetic protein biomarkers have been suggested to closely link to the tumorogenesis and predisposition of Wilms tumor. 
the important ones are uh, the loss of heterozygosity at 1p and 16q in a prospective study on 1000 patients with favorable histology wilms tumor enrolled in envis5 it was found that 11.3% patients had loss of heterozygosity at 1p and 17.4% at 16q and patients with loss of heterozygosity at either of these were found to have increased relapse rates and death risks and the effect was greatest for those with the combined loss of heterozygosity at both 1p and 16q these findings have led to the incorporation of this into the risk stratification for favorable histology films tumor in the current children's oncology group a uh, treatment protocol with intensified treatment recommended for those having these uh, loss of heterozygosities the other important one is the gain of chromosome 1q which is present in nearly 30% of the favorable histology wilms tumor it is also associated with inferior event free survival and overall survival across all the stages report and it has been reported by both cog and siop study groups it's being planned to be incorporated into the risk stratification in the next series of the studies by cog another uh, important uh, is the wnt beta catenin pathway upregulation it has been seen in stromal predominant histology and tegavivent is an antagonist of this pathway and is currently under investigation by cog in phase 2 trials as a possible treatment for its anti tumor activity in recurrent and refractory wilms tumor now coming to the, to the clinical presentation uh classically most of these patients uh, the wilms tumor presents as a silent abdominal mass which is incidentally noticed by the caregivers while bathing the child other than that there can be associated associated hematuria in one third of the patients they can have hypertension in quarter of the patients and <laughs> sometimes they can present as acute abdomen because of the tumor rupture or because of the intratumoral bleed other than that there can be non specific symptoms like fever malaise weight loss and anorexia there can be varicocele on the left sided um worms tumor and then there can be associated stigmata of the congenital anomalies which can help in the detection before i come to the management of worms tumor it's really important to talk about the histology as it plays a very important role in deciding on the type and intensity of the adjuvant treatment that these patients will receive eventually these are uh, the embryonic renal tumors in which there is mimicry of nephronogenesis as the tumor comprises of the three elements namely undifferentiated blastemal cells the differentiated epithelial cells and the stromal cells and in the classical type all these three components are present with one or two components being more prominent and when they are equally represented then it is called the mixed type or the triphasic worms tumor the other type is the anaplastic or the unfavorable type which is present in 4 to 8% of the cases and is further classified as focal and diffuse it has a prognostic significance as overall the patients with anaplastic tumors they are more chemo resistant have more uh, poorer overall and disease free survival when compared with the classical variety now the treatment of wilms tumor it has been regarded as one of the success stories of the pediatric oncology based on the excellent treatment results with a 5 year survival improving from 30% in 1930s to almost 90% now this is attributed to the multidisciplinary multimodality approach and the international co collaborations between the treatment groups across the continents with the improved survival the search is now mostly focused on reducing the toxicity and long term effects in the survivors with limited use of chemotherapy and radiotherapy there are two major treating groups the children's oncology group which is a north american based group and the other one is the sio group which is also known as the society of uh, society internationale de oncology pediatrica it is from the europe and uh, both these strategies they differ in terms of their philosophies in using pre operative chemotherapy the cog group that remains committed uh, to upfront nephrectomy based on the rationale that it provides the necessary biological information for risk stratification and selection of appropriate therapy the european biased sio group on the other hand it continues to administer pre operative chemotherapy in an attempt to downstage the tumor both these so both these uh, treatment groups have their own pros and cons the cog group uh, since it does the primary nephrectomy so they are provided with accurate assessment of unaltered histology and the tumor extent 
and as such the since we have the short short diagnosis so the patients with the alternative diagnosis they do not get the unnecessary chemotherapy however the downside is since the tumors are very large in size there are increased chances of tumor spillage intraoperatively which can increase uh, which can upstage the tumors and hence the requirement and the intensified treatment has to be given post operatively the cyop on the other hand it uses pre operative chemotherapy which reduces the tumor size and thus decreases the chances of tumor rupture intraoperatively and also by decreasing the shrinking the size of the tumors it also increases the feasibility of doing nephron sparing surgery in these patients also by giving the pre operative chemotherapy uh, an assessment of the chemo sensitivity of the tumor is there and as such the tailored treatment can be given however the flip side is that uh, chemotherapy can be given to a patient without a def definite histological uh, diagnosis uh, in which case sometimes uh, the patients who are not having wilms tumor may get unnecessarily the chemotherapy and the chemotherapy uh, the pre operative chemotherapy is known to alter the tumor histology also because of the different treatment philosophies the staging systems followed by each are somewhat different uh, but they are more or less the same in a sense that uh, stage 1 tumors are the ones which are limited to the kidney and the stage 2 are the ones which extend beyond the kidney but then have been completely removed stage 3 tumors are the ones where we have the gross or the microscopic residual tumors or there has been intraoperative spill or there have been positive surgical margins and uh, in state or there is lymph node positivity while as the grade 4 it is uh, hematogenous metastasis uh, um, to to the organs like lungs liver bones and brain and also to the lymph node metastasis outside the abdomen and the stage 5 is common to both and uh, it is bilateral renal tumors with or without pre operative chemotherapy post nephrectomy the intensity of the adjuvant treatment that is given according to the risk stratification from relying solely on the tumor stage initially to define the treatment additional clinical and biological prognostic markers they have been incorporated over the time into the risk stratification schemes in both the groups allowing for a multifactorial precision medicine approach which has decreased the burden of therapy while cog utilizes tumor biology like loss of heterozygosity 1p 16q 1q gain to stratify the intensity of the treatment tumor volume has been added as a risk stratification factor for a subgroup of wilms tumor in cyo other common factors between the two groups they include the stage age of the patient histology and lung nodule response in both the protocols as previously mentioned cog it favors upfront nephrectomy in all the cases except the patients um, in which there is a wilms tumor and they have the solitary kidney there is synchronous bilateral wilms tumor there is genetic risk factors for development of bilateral wilms tumor tumor stromus in the ivc that extends above the level of hepatic veins and tumors involving the contiguous structures when there is a need for removal of the surrounding organs like spleen pancreas or colon and also uh, the patient with extensive pulmonary metastasis which makes them anesthetically at risk uh, for surgery while as in cyo the nephrectomy is done but after 4 to 6 weeks of chemotherapy except in infant infants less than 6 months of age now uh, i'll be going through the management of the tumors in three groups the first will be the localized tumor then i'll come to the metastatic and finally uh, to the stage 5 uh, group so uh, patients with favorable histology wilms tumor they are managed as per the aren053 protocol and uh, according to this protocol the patients have been stratified into three risk groups and uh, the patients who are less than 2 years of age with no syndromic features features and have tumor less than 550 grams they are classified as very low risk uh, tumors and they do not receive any adjuvant therapy uh, the four year event free survival was 89.7% and the overall survival was 100% uh, for these tumors patients with stage 1 and stage 2 depending upon whether the loss of heterozygosity is present or not so the ones who do not have the adverse prognostic factors they are just given two drug chemotherapy with vincristine and actinomycin d while as the ones which have the loss of heterozygosity in them the doxorubicin is added similarly in stage 3 without heterozygosity it is just the three drug regimen and um, flank radiotherapy while as the ones which have the heterozygosity they are switched to uh, an intensive protocol the arn0533 in which they receive cyclophosphamide and etoposide in addition to these and um, 
with these uh, with these new additions and intensification of the treatments it was seen that the four year uh, event free survival it improved for the stage 3 tumors from 61% in and which 5 to 90%. Similarly for stage 1 and stage 2 the standard risk tumors with the addition of doxorubicin in those in which there was loss of heterozygosity the four year event free survival it improved to 84% and the overall survival was 96.1%. Now if we compare the COG and SIO uh we see that uh, in SIO the duration of the chemotherapy it is longer than the uh, COG group and also uh, in SIO they use tumor volume for the intensification of the treatment as the patients with localized stage 2 and 3 intermediate risk tumors they do not receive doxorubicin in the post operative chemotherapy anymore unless the tumor volume after the pre operative chemotherapy is more than 500 ml please Wells tumor is a highly radio sensitive tumor and radiotherapy is used to achieve the local control uh, and if we compare both the protocols so all the stage 3 tumors they get uh, the flank radiation unless there is spillage or there are macroscopic deposits but if we compare the both the radiotherapy doses they are higher uh, they are higher in the sio group and they have been kept in uh, lower in the cog uh, group this has been done due to the awareness that uh, uh, the radiation related uh, late effects are there in the growing children of wilms tumor however in sio to decrease the organ toxicity they are using highly conformal volume to account for the post operative anatomic changes for the image guided instead of the in conventional flank target volume typically treated with opposite and ap parallel fields the cog group is planning to incorporate this intensity modulated radiotherapy in the current trials coming to the stage 4 uh disease 10 to 12% of the patients they present with metastasis and they're mostly most commonly in the lungs or liver metastatic disease per se is not a contraindication to upfront surgery and does not impact the local tumor staging or resection the biological factors and the local stage delineated by the upfront surgery will determine the need for further local therapy but the presence of metastasis may escalate the disease stage and ensuing systemic therapy stage 4 patients they are treated as per the arent 0533 protocol and one of the primary aims of this protocol was to limit the need of uh, whole lung radiotherapy in patients who had a complete response uh, of the pulmonary meds after giving the chemotherapy so uh, in cog arent 0533 uh, study 302 patients with stage 4 were enrolled and they received 6 weeks of three drug uh, regimen uh three drugs vincristin actinomycin and doxorubicin and it was observed that 105 patients had complete response in the chest ct scans after the 6 weeks of this chemotherapy and they were not given uh radiation after this and uh, they were noted to have excellent results with event free survival of 79.5% and overall survival of 96.1% those patients in which there was uh, an incomplete response and also those with loss of heterozygosity including the stage 3 they received additional intensified therapy with four cycles of uh, cyclophosphamide and etoposide along with uh, vad and uh, it was seen that uh, for these patients there was an improvement in the four year event free survival to 96% and uh, for the incomplete response ones there was an improved in the four year event survival to 88%. The SIO protocol it allows for a uh, pulmonary metastatectomy in patients who do not have complete response uh, of the pulmonary nodules after initial chemotherapy and uh, this metastatectomy this can be performed either as a single stage procedure together with the nephrectomy or preferably as a delayed surgery after one to two courses of post operative chemotherapy. patients where metastases are incompletely resected or the resection is not feasible they are um, given a further higher risk chemotherapy regimen but if chemo uh, the complete response is still not achievable either with chemotherapy or with metastatectomy then these patients are subjected to the pulmonary radio therapy this approach may spare more intensive therapy to the patients in which the biopsy it comes out to be fully necrotic or benign so if we uh, compare the radiotherapy uh, treatment in both the groups we see that uh, the patients where there is complete response they are no longer given the pulmonary radiations but the ones in which there there is incomplete response they are still given uh, whole lung irradiation 
and uh, the SIOP group initially they used to give 15 grays uh, for the intermediate risk histology also but after the COG ARN0533 results now they have reduced their uh, radiotherapy to 12 grays. Coming to the stage 5 bilateral Wilms tumor about 6 to 7 percent of the patients they develop synchronous and less than 1 percent metachronous bilateral Wilms tumor with the latter faring worse than the synchronous ones. The prevalence is higher in patients with genetic predisposition syndromes carrying Wilms tumor 1 gene mutation like DDS and Wagger and loss of imprinting at 11P, 15B. Bilateral Wilms tumor has historically been associated with worse oncological outcomes and an increased risk of therapy-related end-stage renal disease over time with a cumulative incidence of 12% in 20 years compared to less than 1% in unilateral Wilms tumor. And these insu renal insufficiency rates are even higher in patients of bilateral Wilms with syndromic uh, with syndromic predispositions and uh, the inferior survival rates they are largely secondary to the management challenge of completing the oncological treatment while retaining the sufficient functional renal parenchyma. The general principles for management are that both the sites they are staged separately and pre-operative chemotherapy is given in uh, both the groups to confine the tumor enabling surgical resectability Surgical planning is done as per the tumor response to the chemotherapy, um, which is in the form of decrease in the size of the tumor or radi radiological changes in favor of necrosis. Pre-op chemo is not given longer than 12 weeks as it rarely brings further response prior to the surgery and unnecessarily increases the treatment toxicity. Therefore, it is not recommended. The less involved kidney is operated on first as it allows for the better preservation of the renal function. For the tumors appearing unresectable at the surgery post chemotherapy, they could be biopsied and the patient treated with further chemotherapy. So, ARN053 protocol it specifically studied bilateral Wilms tumor in patients and rolled from 2009 uh, to 2015. There were a total of 189 patients, and uh, these patients they received six weeks of preoperative chemotherapy uh, with vincristine, actinomycin, and doxorubicin without a biopsy, although. Uh, not doing a biopsy has not been a standard practice in COG, but biopsy was provided based on the premise that uh, there is exceedingly low incidence of non Wilms tumor bilateral renal bases in children and the poor ability to detect anaplastic Wilms tumor even if the biopsy is done. The patients which showed uh, the volumetric regression, which was dis defined as uh, 50% uh, reduction in the tumor volume, bilateral partial nephrectomies was done if it was feasible. If, however, it was not achieved by the six weeks, then further six cycles were given and then uh, the uh, they were assessed for the feasibility of uh, nephron sparing surgery. If the nephron sparing surgery was still not possible, then these patients, uh, then the ADN053 protocol, it advocated for open biopsy at this time to evaluate uh, for anaplasia or uh, rhabdomyoblastic differentiation. So out of the 189 bilateral Wilms tumor patients, it was found that 84% they underwent definite surgery by 12 weeks after initiation of the chemotherapy. And there were um, almost 50% patients who underwent unilateral total nephrectomy with contralateral partial nephrectomy and around 35% patients they underwent bilateral partial nephrectomy. It was observed that there was an improvement in the four-year event-free survival and overall survival compared to the controls in the NWITS 5 uh, group, which were treated with uh, two drug regimen only. 12% of the patients, they relapsed and the vast majority, they occurred within the first 18 months after the diagnosis. And uh, although the um, goal of ARN0534 was to improve nephron sparing surgery to 50%, but this was not achievable as only 39% patients underwent nephron sparing surgery. And the failure of nephron sparing surgery in most cases in the study was believed to be due to the volume of the tumor and its central location. Of patients with bilateral Wilms tumor, bilateral nephrotomy and kidney transplantation may be considered as a treatment option to eliminate the risk of initial or metagronous Wilms tumor development. This subgroup includes patients in whom bilateral nephrotomy would be the only means to achieve the complete accession or in patients with Dennis Rash syndrome in whom the prophylactic or secondary bilateral nephrectomy is an acceptable procedure. If the bilateral nephrectomy is performed, vascular access for dialysis should be inserted at the time of the second nephrectomy and uh, kidney transplantation is usually performed after one to two years 
of the disease free survival the siop umbrella protocol um uh, it is looking in order to maximize uh, it is looking into the optimal duration of the pre operative chemotherapy and the strategy to adopt in the non responsive tumors and the time interval for the evaluation for these has also been kept to 6 weeks as uh, the cog protocol in order to maximize the possibility of bilateral nephron sparing surgery and approach using carboplatin and etoposide in patients with unsatisfactory response to wind cysteine actinomycin d is under evaluation before i come to the surgical controversies uh, the accepted universal standard for wilms tumor is the transperitoneal radical nephrourethrectomy with ipsilateral lymph node sampling the renal pelvis or ureter that can be involved with the tumor and should be divided at the most distal level possible with the advancements of ct and mri the lesions measuring millimeters they can be detected preoperatively so contralateral renal exploration for patients undergoing surgery for unilateral wilms tumor is unnecessary CT has been shown to be equally sensitive to Doppler ultrasound for diagnosing thrombus in the renal vein or vena cava. Sampling of ipsilateral lymph nodes is the current standard of care, but there is a known uh, discrepancy between the clinical assessment and histological findings. With the studies showing that up to forty-one percent of the patients with the stage three they reach that diagnosis based on the pathological lymph node positivity alone. hence the importance of sampling uh, when the lymph nodes are not enlarged clinically despite the cog recommendations uh, there has been a failure to perform lymph node sampling in 9 to 17% of the cases which increases the relative risk of relapse now the next important question how many nodes to be sampled and where the sampling needs to be done it has been demonstrated by both envits 4 and 5 that the likelihood of finding a positive node it increases with sampling of more than equal to 7 nodes and uh, they found that this correlation it plateaued in lymph node positivity rate at about 28% at 7 or more nodes in a multivariate analysis study by zug et al the 5 year overall survival was found to be significantly related to the increased number of nodes removed with the survival improving from 87% with no lymph node sampling done to more than 95% for more than 10 nodes removed the nodes they should be removed from uh, the hilar area the paracaval or the paraiotic uh, area depending upon the tumor size and the aortocaval nodes uh, and the sampling from these areas has also been shown to increase the number of lymph nodes harvest now whether to preserve adrenal gland or not in a retrospective chart review of the two groups of wilms to wilms tumor patients one group who underwent adrenalectomy and the one group where the adrenal gland was spared more at all they found that adrenal gland that showed malignant invasion in only one out of the 58 patients and the peri adrenal fat involvement was found in three there was no statistically significant difference in the retroperitoneal recurrence between the two groups subsequently these findings were confirmed by cog on review of and with four and five cohorts as well and uh, renal tumor study group siop also recommends renal adrenal preservation if a safe resection margin between the tumor and the gland can be guaranteed coming to the nephron sparing surgery the current indications for nephron sparing surgery are bilateral wilms tumor solitary kidney abnormal contralateral kidney high risk of metachronous tumors in genetic predispositions and nephroblastomatosis recently the possibility that nephron sparing surgery should be considered in children with unilateral disease uh, without predispositions has come to the fore as patients with wilms tumor they are at increased risk of renal dysfunction over time as the surgery itself removes functional renal parenchyma and certain chemotherapeutic agents and radiotherapy are directly nephrotoxic the tech but the controversy is the technical feasibility and potential benefits of the nephron sparing approach must be weighed against the increased risk of intraoperative spill or a positive margin in nephron sparing surgery which again can lead to upstaging of the local upstaging to local stage 3 and will require three drug chemotherapy and flank radiation which again will compromise the benefits of the nephron sparing surgery the other important consideration is the questionable benefit of the approach given the limited rates of long term renal failure in unilateral wilms tumor patients without genetic predispositions who underwent radical nephrourethrectomy now on comparing the nephron sparing surgery with the radical nephro to me in a study by spiegel et al comparing the complication profiles of nephron sparing surgery uh, versus the total nephrectomy it was found that nephron sparing surgery 
had a higher complication rate when compared to the nephron sparing surgery and then the prolonged urinary leakage was the on was the most common and only statistically significant uh, complication which was more common in the nephron sparing uh, group however on review of the same study uh, it was found that majority of the nephron sparing surgery in the study was done in context of the bilateral venous tumor which is um, more complex in its nature but in the same study group when the unilateral non syndromic venous tumor alone were compared then the difference in the complication rates between nephron sparing surgery and radical nephrectomy was found to be less pronounced a systematic review of more than 4000 venous tumor patients it showed similar rupture rates between ne radical nephrectomy and nephron sparing surgery as well as the recurrence rates and the survival rates using the surveillance epidemiology and end result data Uh, Wang et al. They evaluated some eighteen hundred patients, and uh, who are, out of these hundred fourteen patients, they underwent nephron sparing surgery, and the follow up was for seven point one years, and it was found that the nephron sparing surgery was associated with smaller bilateral tumors and with omission of lymphadenectomy. Despite that, the overall survival was similar between the patients undergoing nephron sparing surgery and radical nephrectomy. So as of now, uh, the Open Cyop RTSG umbrella protocol it allows for nephron sparing surgery in uh, in a unilateral non syndromic Wilms tumor, uh, which are polar or peripheral non infiltrating Wilms tumor after giving the new adjuvant chemotherapy, provided certain criteria are met, like the tumor volume it should be less than three hundred mL in volume, and uh, the tumor is localized without any evidence of preoperative rupture. intraluminal extension no adjacent organ invasion no intravascular throm thrombus no multifocality and a negative margin with renal remnant having greater than 66% of the original kidney volume is expected nephron sparing surgery is generally not advised for upfront resection of the suspected bones tumor this makes it much less likely that uh, nss would be performed in cog institutions than the cyop ones Also, the positive lymph nodes at pathology after nephron sparing surgery they indicate radiotherapy, but not necessarily a completion nephrectomy. In a study published in two thousand and fourteen, the overall survival and the event-free survival in unilateral venous tumor were compared for the nephron sparing surgery group with the total nephrectomy, and the overall survival and the event-free survival were found to be similar amongst the two groups. in the nss groups again the tumors they were found to be smaller in size and were often limited to the kidney incidence of the positive positive surgical margins in the nss group was 9% while as in the total nephrectomy group it was 13% as per the data from the cyop wilms tumor trial 2001 which was published in 2014 uh, nephron sparing surgery was only employed in 3% of the cases whereas based on literature one would have expected 5 to 10% of the cases to be eligible the post operative pathological specimen review suggests nss may be applicable in 25% of the children with unilateral wilms tumor following new adjuvant chemotherapy nonetheless even large volume single centers only report application as possible in 4 to 9% the reason for, for this discrepancy has not been clear Another area of controversy in the management of Wilms tumor is the minimal invasive surgery although laparoscopic and uh, laparoscopic assisted robotic urological surgeries uh, they are often the technique of choice for nephrectomy in the adult population but uh, their use uh, in the treatment of Wilms tumor is um, still not that much only 5% of the surgeries for Wilms tumor are performed using the minimal invasive surgery according to the national cancer database and uh, the arguments against minimal invasive surgery they include the skill required for laparoscopy decreased lymph node sampling a perceived higher chance of tumor spillage or uh, incomplete resection which affects the overall survival and the need for laparotomy to remove the mass regardless of whether the procedure is started in an open or a laparoscopic fashion currently there are no gold standard recommendations regarding the minimal invasive surgery in the management of films tumor The CIO protocol umbrella it does not advocate uh, for uh, minimal invasive surgery given the lack of the safety reporting. However, it does provide some guidance where it states that uh, that is permissible only for small central tumors with a rim of non-malignant renal tissue where adequate lymph node sampling is possible. And the co contraindications they include the tumor infiltration into the extra renal structures, its extension beyond the border of the spinal column, 
traumas in the renal vein or vena cava and uh, tumor without any response to chemotherapy and uh, lack of experience in the laparoscopic surgery so uh, coming uh, to the long term follow up in these patients so because of the excellent relapse free survival and the overall survival there is an increased importance of minimizing the long term effects because uh, of the exposure to the cancer therapy in the childhood these patients they have long term health implications as such a major initiative in the development of modern treatment protocols has been the reduction of anthracyclines and or radiation dose and omission of radiotherapy for certain populations Now coming to the renal functions first long term risk of renal failure 20 years after the treatment among standard unilateral non syndromic um, favorable histology wilms tumor patient is 0.6% although a relatively small figure it reflects an incidence that is eight fold higher than the expected in the age match general population both cog and siop studies they have shown microalbuminuria in 24 hour urinary collection detected in 84% of the patients include indicating the evidence of hyperinfiltration injuries in patients with nephrectomy and abdominal irradiation the renal dysfunction is more common in a study uh, which evaluated the presence of hypertension and impaired renal function in a group of 75 long term survivors of the non syndromic uh, unilateral wilm tumor who were treated without nephrotoxic chemotherapy or ionizing radiations they found that uh, only 16 patients had gfr less than 90 ml and no patients had gfr less than 60 ml and five patients had hypertension at the time of last follow up no patient developed end stage renal disease they concluded that patients with unilateral wilms tumor treated with unilateral radical nephrectomy without nephrotoxic chemotherapy like um cyclophosphamide ifosamide and etoposide or ionizing radiations they appear to be at low risk of developing significant long term renal dysfunction but monitoring and counseling are important for uh, early detection of the subtle anomalies coming to the musculoskeletal uh, effects uh, the scoliosis and musculoskeletal abnormalities they have been found more frequently in the irradiated patients and abdominal irradiation that can produce significant reduction in the sitting height and more modest decrease in the standing height flank and whole abdomen radiotherapy doses of 20 to 30 gray they produce a height loss uh, calculated by age at the treatment like for a child receiving a treatment at 1 year of age there will be a reduction in height by 9 cm similarly uh, at 10 years it will be 5.5 cm female survivors of wilms tumor had a 9.1 times increased risk of uh, invasive breast carcinoma in a study done in the nwtsg group uh, in 294 to females who were followed from uh, 15 to uh, from the age of 15 years to the year 2013 and the risk was found to be highest among those who were treated with pulmonary radiotherapy as low as 12 grays and uh, it was seen that um, the invasive breast carcinoma developed in 29 patients and uh, the 20, 24 out of these 29 patients developed breast cancer earlier than 40 years there was no difference found in the women who received or did not receive the abdominal radiotherapy the cumulative incidence of secondary malignant neoplasms at 15 years after the diagnosis is 1.6% as per the envits group and 0.65% as per the sio protocols and the tumors they are mostly seen in the irradiated fields and soft tissue sarcoma is the most common then there can be breast and thyroid malignancies leukemia risk it stops at 5 risks at 5 years the solid tumor risk that goes beyond 15 years and rising radiotherapy is the single most important cause reported cardiotoxicity it includes the electrocardiographic changes changes in the myocyte morphology decreased cardiac function and congestive heart failure cumulative incidence of congestive heart failure 20 years after the diagnosis in wilms tumor is approximately 4% in patients whose treatment plan included doxorubicin with a direct dose dependent relationship with each 100 mg per meter square of doxorubicin exposure increasing the relative risk of congestive heart failure by 3.3% the mega scans they can be done to assess the left ventricular ejection fraction and the myocardial movements and thus timely discontinuation of doxorubicin that can prevent the congestive heart failure the fertility 
uh gonadal irradiation and chemotherapeutic agents uh especially the alkylating agents they can cause damage to the reproductive systems and increased rate of primary ovarian insufficiency is associated with the receipt of uh, abdominal radiotherapy that appears to be dose dependent providing the justification for discussions focused on fertility preservation options for the female patients with womb tumor requiring whole abdominal radiotherapy the envits long term follow up study evaluated 700 maternal offspring pairs and they found that the pregnancies were complicated with hypertension premature labor and malposition of the fetus and this was statistically more frequent in the irradiated women and was related to the radiation therapy dose the other effects they include radiation pneumonitis restrictive lung diseases scoliosis kyphosis reduced lung capacity and subsequent tumors gi strictures especially for the ones who receive the abdominal radiotherapy and uh, cog4 that uh, studies they reported a dose related incidence of hepatotoxicity in the form of veno occlusive disease in patients receiving chemotherapy especially vincristine and actinomycin d a recent publication by wheel et al in 2023 they evaluated the long term complications specifically the chronic health conditions in patients with unilateral non syndromic wilms tumor from a data abstracted fr- abstracted from the childhood cancer survivor study it's a multi institutional 30 year retrospective cohort study of approximately 25000 wilms tumor patients who were at least 5 year survivors who received care at the several children's hospitals throughout the united states and canada for these patients the mortality data subsequent cancers and chronic health conditions were stratified based on the pa- based on the treatments the patient received and the primary focus was placed on the patients who received primary nephrectomy with uh, vincristine and actinomycin d the two drug combination individuals receiving this therapy they demonstrated a 50% increase in relative risk of moderate and severe chronic health conditions including renal failure bowel obstruction ovarian failure and heart failure almost one third of all the patients they experienced at least one significant chronic health condition which was three fold increased compared to the uh, sibling controls heart failure that uh, remained similar in this group as well likely due to the lack of exposure to the radiation and that doxorubicin was omitted in this group as the com- as the cancer complexity increases the therapeutics they increase and the long term health issues such as heart failure they can have 42 times increased relative risk compared to the siblings another a uh, similarly another study by american um, published in uh, american academy of pediatrics this study they evaluated 280 survivors of wilms tumor and compared them to age and sex matched controls survivors of wilms tumor they experienced a uh, three h- times higher burden of chronic health conditions uh, and they also had higher uh, risk of neurocognitive and physical functional deficits the most prevalent grade 2 to 4 health conditions were endocrine cardiovascular pulmonary neurological neoplastic and kidney conditions a uh, long term survival of patients with wilms tumor has steadily improved over the last several decades and it now exceeds 90% following uh, either of the treatment strategies but still uh, there's a subgroup of patient which still has poor event free survival and this includes the relapsed patients the patients with unfavorable histologies like anaplastic histology and the ones with bilateral or unilateral high risk tumors aren 1921 is a phase 2 clinical trial that is studying the effectiveness of combination uh, chemotherapy in treating these subset of patients with the newly diagnosed stage 2 to stage 4 with the diffuse anaplastic unfavorable histology or the relapsed patients um, with favorable histology and uh, this is currently uh, this trial is going on and uh, they are uh, they are thinking of intensifying the chemotherapies in these two groups so this brings to the conclusion of this talk so majority of wilms tumor patients they are successfully uh, treated with the excellent survival rates more than 90% managed with either of the uh, strategies still there's a subset of patients with anaplastic bilateral or recurrent disease that does not show the same response with the current protocols and regimens treatment strategies are now focused on reducing the intensity of treatment to reduce the toxicity and long term outcomes based on the risk stratification wherein the intensified treatment is given for the patients with poor prognosticators while reducing the therapy and subsequent long term complications for those with uh, favorable prognostic factors 
nephron sparing surgery in a selected group of patients may also help to serve preserve uh, functional renal units and long term renal functions without compromising the overall survival and inventory survival thank you and uh, recently the global initiative for childhood cancer by who it has included uh, it has included six tumors uh, to to provide the protocols and uh, to help with the management of these patients in the other countries as well other than the western countries and wilms tumor is one of these uh, tumors that has been included by who in this initiative thank you